Hello, I'm Josephine Chang. After two tough years, there's good news this week for the airline industry and for Seattle's Alaska Air Group. Alaska was among a number of U.S. airlines that saw their stocks fly higher on reports that travel demand may be increasing. But growing demand may also be bad news for travelers, signaling airfare increases later this year. That on top of all the new fees that airlines are charging. We went to SeaTac Airport to see how passengers are coping with the changes and how they've affected our hometown airline. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. Remember when airlines were glamorous and flying was fun? Well, times have changed a bit. You know, it seems like a lot of hands-off sort of, uh, you know, the like airlines don't, uh, there's less like personal touch. It seems like they charge you for every little everything. The last couple of times I've flown, everything is being taken away slowly, gradually. So I really miss uh, the old days. The trend to no frills flying has its roots in the deregulation of the airline industry in 1978. Competition drove down fares, while at the same time, oil prices and other costs were rising. In the shakeout that followed, more than 200 U.S. airlines have merged, been taken over, or gone out of business. Scott Hamilton is an industry analyst. It's a tremendously difficult business. Um, um, some people like to point out that since the Wright brothers flew in 1903 in the aggregate, the airline industry in this country has never made money. It's lost billions of dollars in the aggregate. Airline profits are razor thin in the best of times, and the last two years have not been good. Since September of 08, after the financial market meltdowns worldwide, the worst uh, recession since the uh, 40s, the airlines have had to struggle to find premium passengers. They've had to find, struggle to find passengers generally. For passengers, one bright spot has been the low fares that airlines have had to offer. But for airlines, it's difficult to raise fares once they've been lowered. All it takes is, is one airline to decide not to match the fare raise, and then everybody else has to rescind those fares. So in a, in a desperate attempt to uh, find revenue, again, with rising oil, with the global recession, the airlines have imposed fees. That's why most airlines are now making up revenue by charging a fee for checking your bag. Every time I have to pay $15, um, and it's frustrating because sometimes I travel very light. More fees if the bag is overweight. Well, you're definitely checking your weight before you get on, like your weight of your bags, because they'll charge you an extra 50 if you're over 50. Bigger fees for ticket changes. Uh, I had to change my flight, so there was a fee for changing my flight because I actually have to extend my stay a little bit longer. And then, of course, the fee for the flight was actually Actually more so I think my ticket ended up being about two or three hundred dollars more just to make one change plus a lot more of those niceties that airline passengers used to take for granted are going away you know I used to get like a small meal or something it, this has been for a while now but now it's just like water or some juice or some coffee if you want I think it's about, been about the same you know maybe some cutbacks you know instead of giving you peanuts the you know, they've cut back on that, you know, it's just, you, know, you just get like some soda and that's about it. Uh, yeah, actually they made an announcement, which I didn't know, and this happened to me today, that they don't have blankets and pillows on the flights anymore. Alaska and its sister airline, Horizon, fly nearly half the passengers at SeaTac Airport. Here's Scott's take on how Seattle's homegrown airline has done with industry-wide struggles. But Alaska Airlines, which was for many, many decades, right at the top of, of passenger service, passenger amenities, free food uh, has, has changed. You now buy on board with Alaska. You now check your bags and pay a fee with Alaska. So even our local iconic airline that still has tremendous passenger loyalty has had to adjust to these market realities and start charging fees for many of these things. Alaska has also maintained profitability by innovating with electronic ticketing and check-in. But with Alaska Airlines, you've also seen uh, here at SeaTac Airport the entirely new uh, check-in system and this very open-air method of, of passengers coming in. They no longer have the ticket counter there that we're so used to. And that's an efficiency drive and a cost-cutting drive on the part of Alaska, but it's one of these things that actually benefited passengers because they get through the check-in system so much more quickly. 
It's a trend passengers are likely to see continued, a trade of personal service for efficiency, along with individual fees, more security restrictions, and higher fares. So the airport experience, I think, is going to get worse. With respect to the airlines and, and uh, their ability to make profits, uh, that's going to depend on the price of oil as well as uh, other uh, glo geopolitical global events. And as oil goes back up, uh, particularly if it starts to spike back up, the airlines are going to continue to look for ways to cut back, and that could trickle its way back down to us. Pack up, let's fly away. So next, we go to the top to find out what's ahead for Alaska Airlines. I'm happy to welcome to our CEO Spotlight, Bill Ayer, Chairman, President, and CEO of Alaska Air Group, which of course includes Alaska Airlines. Welcome Great. to About the Money. Great to be here. Thanks. You know, as we've heard in the story, the airline industry is probably one of the most competitive ever. High volatility combined with low margins. And correct me if I'm wrong, but in the last quarter of the nine major air carriers, five only posted modest gains and, and four of them lost money. It's been a very tough time. The industry has been very challenged for a long, long time. And we're real fortunate at Alaska, Alaska Air Group uh, to be posting some different numbers and moving in a different direction. Right, because you you were one of the ones posting gains, thank goodness. Right. Um, I understand that some of the biggest declines have been in business travel and international travel, which is an advantage right. to Alaska. It is. We're, we're mainly a domestic airline, and uh, the majority of our traffic is more leisure-oriented rather than business. So the, the economics have been better for us just because of the, of the nature of the traffic. And you have said that with leisure travel, you can always generate more demand by lowering fares. Is that right? right. Do you plan to continue doing that? Well, the, the whole industry needs more revenue. But yes, we're going to price our product uh, to, to meet customer demand. And certainly in a slower economic time, uh, people will find more lower fares available. And that's been happening. In fact, there have been air, air fare wars, <laughs> you yep. know. Yep. But in the short term, you expect that to continue. Do you think that can continue over the long haul? It can't continue over the long haul. Fares are too low. Uh, revenues have to go up for the industry. And, uh, and that's just part of, of business and what has to happen. For the, for the moment, we're offering some really low fares uh, all over our system. Uh, to the Bay Area, for example, we have fares of 69 or $79 each way. Mm. Uh, LAX, I think, is at 89 right now. So, you know, note to the viewers out there that if you, want to, if you want to travel for a low fare, this is a pretty good time to do it. It is. And I noticed that another way the airlines compensate is sort of cut back on capacity, you know, cut back on flights and to ensure fuller flights. Alaska has done that, too. We have. Uh, last year in 2009, we reduced our overall capacity, our seat miles, by about four and a half percent. But if you look at our network, it looks like we grew a lot because hmm. of all the new routes that we, that we started. So we started about 12 new markets, new city pairs in the last 12 months. So overall, a reduction in capacity a little bit, but really reallocating airplanes around the system for, for better revenue. I noticed that you've added um, a spot in Hawaii and then also where in Texas and Florida? You bet. You bet. Uh, Austin, Atlanta. But Hawaii's really been the big story here in the last uh, year and a half or so for us. So about 11% of our total capacity now is from the mainland to Hawaii. In our service, uh, a lot out of Seattle, we have Anchorage, we have Portland, Oakland, soon to start San Jose and Sacramento. The majority of what we do is not to Honolulu, although we have Honolulu flights from Anchorage and from Seattle, but mainly focused on the Mauis and Konas and Kauais. Right. So that direct flight to the, to the out island. That's right. That's where Seattleites want to go is directly to the beach, exactly. right? You got it, <laughs> especially this time of year. Do you, do you envision any other route changes in the next year or so? You know, our planning folks are always looking at those opportunities. And uh, I think that uh, hopefully as the economy continues to recover, we're going to have more opportunities to, to start growing a little bit and adding, adding new markets. And some of that may be out of Seattle. We've done a lot of building out of, out of Seattle with our network. We're looking at Portland as another opportunity and then maybe down the road a few years uh, more, more out of California. Sure. We always hear an ear, an earful about all the fees that all the airlines are charging, or most right. of them anyway. You know, baggage fees, fees for meals, fees for even blankets and pillows I'm hearing about. Is, is this a permanent trend in the industry? I think it is a trend. And as I said, you know, revenues have to go up. And it seems like a, a fair way to do it. I think people are adjusting to it pretty well. And it's not unlike uh, other products in our in our economy, hotel rooms, different different product features, different costs. Rental cars are that way. A lot of things are are that. And so uh, we debated a long time about about baggage at Alaska. We were one of the last carriers to go with the bag right. charge. 
$15 for the first bag. Uh, we did it a little bit differently and we added a, a baggage guarantee. So if your bag doesn't arrive within 25 minutes of your arrival, then you're entitled to either money or miles in compensation. We've had very few of those uh, because we've been doing such a great job on the, on the bag delivery. But we want to make sure there's value in all of this. And it does make sense that, that people, if they want a little extra service that costs us extra, that then they're going to pay a little more for that. We want to be careful. We, people call this unbundling of the product. We don't want to go too far because it gets to be like nickel and dime. We're going to be very careful with this, but there are a few things that we think make sense. Sure. There are a couple of airlines that have sort of bucked that trend. Continental still serves meals, I believe. Southwest right. is choosing not to uh, charge baggage fees. Do you think you lose some business due to that? But, you know, it makes up for it, revenue side. Yeah, I, th I think you have to look at the whole package. And, yeah. and what we're really interested in is customer value, which means is, is do we offer a, a good product for a very good price? And so we're, you know, being a smaller airline, we can spend more time listening to our customers and, and, and responding faster, a little bit more nimble at Alaska than some of the big airlines in terms of making changes, figuring out what customers want, what they're willing to pay for. At the end of the day, customers get to decide how successful any business is. You sure. know, they vote with their, with, their, with their wallets, they vote with their feet. And so far, they're voting in our direction. Yes. So you're based in Seattle, as is Boeing, major right. airplane yep. um, manufacturer. Do you get a special deal, and are you taking any new airplanes um, in the coming years? We, li we love Boeing. We love Boeing airplanes, and uh, over the last couple of years, we've moved to an all-Boeing fleet uh, at Alaska, so we have all 737s. We have a few airplanes coming next year uh, and a few the year after, mainly replacing some of the older airplanes that are coming off lease. And then we have a very good order book out for the next several years beyond that, which will give us the opportunity to grow if, if conditions permit. All right. Well, we wish you all the luck, and you are welcome back to About the Money anytime, Bill. Great. Good to be here. Thank you. Still ahead, what Northwest homeowners should know about earthquake insurance. If the big one happens here, would your home be protected? But first, back to the skies. We'll find out how to navigate your way through all those fees and restrictions for your next flight. And joining me is Steve Danishak, president of TMA Travel in Seattle. Welcome to About the Money. Bill Air calls it unbundling or debundling. Mm -hmm. I've also heard it called a la carte pricing. And let me just read off a few we haven't even mentioned yet because there are so many. Reservations by phone, odd size luggage, preferred seat assignments such as aisle seats or, mm -hmm. you know, more legroom, carbon offset fees, fuel surcharges, higher fees for pets and unaccompanied minors. The list goes on and on. I mean, what's mm -hmm. going to be next? Swiping your credit card in the bathroom every time uh, you go? <laughs> actually, that, that may be. It's actually been designed. Really? Uh, but what's happening here is the airlines, they know how much they can get from a, the fare. They have to be competitive on the air fare. So the question to the airlines was, how else can we raise additional revenue? Everyone knows the airlines have been in trouble for a long time. The recession is not helping. So what they're looking at are all other ways that they can sort of unbundle from the fare and break it down into components. Don't the airlines hear howls of protest? I mean, how do well, they sort of get away with it, if you will? Well, here's the rationale. The rationale is there are some services you may not need. Why should you pay for them? It used to be that the fare covered everything, meals, baggage, the works. Now they're saying, okay, if you're not going to take a bag, why should you pay for it? If you're not going to eat a meal, why should you pay for that? And, and now it's kind of morphed into, all right, let's look at the whole selection of added value items that a passenger might uh, uh, be interested in or not interested. Air Canada, for instance, if you don't claim frequent flyer mileage and you don't ask for a seat assignment, you actually get credits on your ticket. Oh. So uh, what they're looking at, and we, we, we're still within the envelope. We haven't pushed past it very much. The public has been fairly accepting of it because the rationale makes sense. Now, the fact is that it's a huge, huge moneymaker for all airlines. How Nearly much? Nearly $10 billion wow. for worldwide airlines in uh, 2008. Alaska Airlines is over $160 million annually wow. from the sale, also including frequent flyer miles, along with the luggage and everything else. Now, what we're seeing, the trend we're going to be seeing, however, will be that some of these fares and fees, um, some of these fees will actually be changing. We know that some airlines started with the first bag fee at $15, now it's $20, maybe it's going to be $25, second mm. bag 30, uh, 25 to 30 to 35 uh, I expect to see the maximum weight of luggage go down so that you're actually paying more for extra excess luggage and, and, and heavier things. The pet fees have gone up. So a lot of the fees are changing, and I think what the airlines are doing now is to, is to see how much they can get out of each of the fee types before the public says enough's enough and, and takes their suitcase to FedEx to send to their hotel. <laughs> Do they lose any passengers? 
passengers to airlines like Southwest that doesn't right, charge right, baggage fees. Right, and fees. that's been a very interesting thing. Southwest doesn't have baggage fees, so the, 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 and they are putting their money, losing $100 million a year by not collecting for their, their uh, luggage, saying, well, we'll make that up in additional passengers. They have uh, created a market shift of about 1%. Only 1%? Mar only 1%. And, and the reason it isn't more than that, uh, two, two reasons, actually. One is that many of the people who buy Southwest gravitate towards lower fares. They will fly, fly on any airline that has a low fare. They don't, there's no right. loyalty there. And two, a lot of passengers that do travel a lot and understand the value of the loyalty program, the frequent flyer mileage program. Oh, so they don't want to switch because right. they want to For instance, accrue. if you have an Alaska frequent flyer uh, mileage plan, you're probably not going to fly Southwest because you'll get no miles and no credit at all. What can the savvy traveler do to avoid some of these fees or at least cut down the number of well, them? Well, uh, very interesting, a lot of little tricks. Uh, for instance, we know that the call centers now have fees of 15 to $20 if you call and make a reservation. Uh, okay, fine, call, get the lowest fare, and then go online and book it there. Yourself. And book <laughs> okay. it yourself, saving the fee. And, and, and trust me, the, the airline agents know, know that, and they're, they're perfectly accommodating of it. Mm -hmm. I've never had one get upset that someone is telling, that they're telling a passenger about Anything low else? fares and, and that. Okay. And then you mentioned, like, mm -hmm. FedExing your luggage. Well, Did some people actually, actually do that? They do that, and for two <laughs> reasons. Number one, FedEx actually tracks your luggage from the time they pick it up until they deliver it to your hotel. Uh, so what do you get from the extra cost? And it's really not as much as you might think. Uh, the luggage is delivered to your hotel. You don't have to take it in and out of the airport. You don't have to wait a baggage claim. <laughs> and you always know where it is. If you check your luggage on a legacy carrier, you, they know it checks in. You maybe get it at your destination, <laughs> right. but if it's lost, they don't know where it is. Yes, good information. Yeah. Well, I really thank you for being on About the Money, Steve Danachek. <laughs> Coming up, the earthquake in Chile is a reminder to us. We could have the same kind of quake here. Would your insurance pay if your home was damaged? Here with that important information is Carl Newman, president of the Northwest Insurance Council, an industry group charged with educating the public about insurance. Welcome to About the Money. You Thank remind you. me that this is the ninth anniversary of the Nisqually earthquake near Olympia, 6.8 on the Richter scale, so we definitely know earthquakes can happen here. But what a lot of people may not realize is that earthquake damage isn't really covered by the standard homeowner's policy, right? Right, it's specifically excluded from the policy and you have to get special coverage. So earthquake insurance, how much it costs depends on what type of home you own, I understand. And I understand that brick homes cost nearly double what a wood home would cost. Why, why is that? Wood flexes in a quake and masonry brick shatters. So your, your devastation in a brick or masonry structure is much higher in a large quake than it would be with a wood frame home which may survive the quake. Give us some um, idea of the cost, because what I hear is, my gosh, earthquake insurance is so expensive. It's only expensive compared to other types of insurance. Homeowner's insurance is probably your best value, average $548 a year here in Washington. If you look at my home, $814 a year to cover the, the home for homeowner's insurance, another $706 for the earthquake part of it, bringing it up to about $1,520 a year. So the earthquake insurance, if you had a wood home, it would be about what, double what Roughly your standard double policy? what your standard policy would be. And if you compare that, my two older cars, almost $2,000 a year to cover that. And my home is my most valuable asset. And the brick home would be how much more? It would be somewhere in the neighborhood of, of three to four times as much because of the damage that it would sustain in a quake. Okay, and, and why, and also there's the deductible, right? How much right. is the deductible? Deductibles are 10 to 15 to 20 percent, depending on the policy. What that does is it makes it affordable, meaning that the smaller losses we would cover ourselves. So it's a 10 to 20 percent deductible on each coverage. 20 percent of your home value? So if you had a $500,000 home, it could be $50,000 to $100,000 of damage that's not covered? Yes. Wow. That seems like a lot. It is a lot. However, if you look at it the other way, the numbers I was thinking of was a $400,000 house, and you would get 300, if a 10% deductible applied to your home and the contents, you would get $360,000 for your, to rebuild your home and $252,000 to replace your belongings. That's $612,000, which is significant when you consider that the only, only disaster assistance typically available is low interest loans. Right, right, And so that's that true. gets you a long way toward getting back to where you were. 
What, what about retrofitting, earthquake retrofitting for your home? Does that um, um, save on insurance or will you even be covered if you don't do that? Some companies won't allow you to get a policy unless you've retrofitted your home and these are typically for homes built before 1980 and that's bolting the home to the foundation. In the uh, Northridge quake you saw a lot of homes dance off the foundation and fall into the basement. Yeah. That's why retrofitting is so important. But there are companies that will offer it, it's just more. Yeah, given the cost and the deductibles, I hear a lot of people just saying, I'm going to skip it and take my chances. What, what do you say to that? I think you should very seriously consider it. Earthquake insurance is something that everyone should look at because this is the second highest earthquake risk in the nation, mm. right here in the Northwest. So the geologists tell us it's not a question of if we'll have a big quake, but when. They believe that we'll have a quake on the magnitude of the, of the, the Chile quake sometime in, in the coming years. They just don't know when. Wow. So in the southeast, they have hurricanes. In the Midwest, they have tornadoes. But here in the Pacific Northwest, we not only have earthquake risk, we have all kinds of disaster risk, right? <laughs> we, for sure, Variety, you cannot beat the Northwest. It's a crazy place for us all to live, but we love it here. Because uh, we have flooding, we flooding, have tsunami, Tsunami, wildfire, windstorm, mudslide, mudslides. landslide, volcanoes, and earthquakes. Oh my gosh. So let's talk about what is and isn't covered by your standard homeowner's insurance out of all those disasters? Your standard homeowner's policy will cover you against windstorm and wildfire, volcanic blast, volcanic hmm. ash. Doesn't cover the mud flow from a volcanic eruption. So mud flow, mudslides, landslides, flood, earthquakes, and, and uh, flooding. I think we talked about flooding already. Those all require special coverage. Wow, really? So, and tsunami, that would be considered flood as well? It's covered under the flood policy, yes. National oh. Flood Insurance covers that. Because a lot of earthquakes will then trigger a tsunami, and that's not covered in, in your standard homeowners in policy either. Right. And only wildfires, you said, so not like regular fires from lots of different things. Standard what if an earthquake fire, causes an, a fire? Earthquake causes a fire, the fire damage would be covered. Okay. The damage from the earthquake wouldn't. I see, I see. And you were saying that the insurance industry sometimes takes a beating because people are surprised when things aren't right. being covered and you want people to know what you know, what is and what isn't. Because you, you get a lot right. of complaints, don't you, from people saying, I'm so surprised this isn't covered. Well, people think it's a homeowner's policy, everything should be covered. But it's important for people to realize it's a, it's a contract saying these things will be covered, these things will not be covered. We're gonna charge you for these. You don't get charged for this, but you also don't get coverage when it happens. So we really encourage people to read through the policy, talk to your agent if you don't understand what's covered, and go to the website we've put out there for people to, that helps them understand what is and isn't covered and make good financial decisions about what you believe you need protection for. And, and you started a new website, which we're going to link to our kcts9.org website, educating people about all kinds of insurance, right? We launched that on the anniversary of the Nisqually quake. It's Get Ready NW and Get Ready Northwest, Get Ready NW.org. And we really encourage people to go look at what's out there and begin to educate themselves so that they're not surprised. We want them to have accurate expectations about what is and isn't covered. And I think that will really help them going forward. Good information. Thank you so much, Carl Newman. Thank you. And you can find links to more information about protecting and insuring your home against earthquakes on our website, kcts9.org slash about the money. Coming up next week on About the Money, the Seattle housing market has hit a new low. And in 30 years of real estate, I've never seen the, um, the longevity of the decline like it is this time. We'll find out what that means for homeowners here and when conditions might improve. And we'll find a bright spot in Redmond, a green new development where units sold fast. It really is a phenomenal story because we were a very hot market right here on this little street in a very cool real estate market. Plus, how to escape unemployment by reinventing yourself. That's all next week, so be sure to join us. I'm Josephine Chang, thanking you, our viewers, and all the members of KCTS 9 for your financial support. If you aren't a member yet, please join at kcts9.org. See you next week, because it's all about the money. Support for About the Money comes from the Washington State Department of Financial Institutions, providing the financial education information you need to make informed decisions for a sound financial future. Details at www.dfi.wa.gov or 1-877-RING-DFI. And by Washington State Employees Credit Union, helping members achieve their financial dreams for more than 50 years. Not-for-profit WSECU makes members' lives easier by providing quality financial services and building trusted relationships. WSECU, where membership means more.
and by KCTS9 members. Thank you.